Um, speaking of India and white ball stuff, just before we um, we we'll get to a break in a sec, but uh, the Champions Trophy, um, I read in one place it might be moving to India. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but, um, gee, a bit going on this week again. We, we touched on it in last week's show. Um, yep. The BCCI denied the trophy tour going to – I'm not sure if it was literally Kashmir or like adjacent to Kashmir, but either way, there was a, there was a, um, there was a, um, a brouhaha around that. Um, the chairman of the PCB, who we're going to talk about a bit, well, Daniel Russell is going to in, in a little bit when we do an update on the Jason Gillespie um, uh, Farago, which uh, we, we probably should have teased at the start of the show, but here we are now. Um, he's saying that there has never been a formal request to the PCB to split the tournament between Pakistan and the UAE. So he's kind of like shrugging his shoulders saying, well, until I get the formal request, mm. we're not going to consider it. As far as they're concerned, the tournament will be held in India. Um, mm. And look, yeah, it, it's I, – I maintain my position that when push comes to shove, the financial imperative will be for Pakistan to roll over. But like, maybe they don't. Maybe they mm. maybe they draw a line in the sand and say, no, 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 it's our tournament um, and India will tour here. Um, mm. the, the, this point was made by Gideon Haig, I think, um, on his substack during the week on the Cricket at Al uh, piece that it's an inherently political position that the bloke who runs the PCB because ultimately it's mm. a political appointee. But the politics applies on both sides because the the BCCI have been, if you again, according to reports, have been um, told by the government they're not to tour India for this Champions Trophy. So um, yes, the, these things are complex. There's, there's no easy answer. Um, but we're coming up to one of these um, notorious friction points between India and Pakistan from a cricket perspective, and that tournament's only four months away. I guess if you're Pakistan and if you're the PCB, you would say at least you need to make them make you do it. Um, yeah. You know, and, and like there's been some of this talk coming out of the the US in the last couple of weeks of people saying, oh, well, the incoming administration will just ignore all of the laws and ignore um, ignore the the houses, ignore courts, ignore norms and do whatever they want. And other people are saying, well, they they still have to, like you can't just let them do that. You can't just accept ahead of time that that's what's going to happen and then not actually use all of those mechanisms to try to stop it happening. So it, like it's like make them make them override those things, make yeah. them actually do the thing. Don't, don't preemptively concede ground. So I could see why if you were the PCB, you'd, you'd say, you know, they're going to, you know, the BCCI are going to have to push and do it publicly and make the request and then make the demand and then make the threats, like get the threat on the record that they're going to pull out of the tournament and thus um, scupper it financially and cause the financial damage to the ICC and all the rest of it. And then when you're under that amount of public pressure, then you can be more justified in making the decision to give in, right? Like yeah. roll over when you when you're genuinely under threat. And look, if, if, if they did pull out, I mean, imagine that tournament did get hosted in India. I mean, wouldn't that be the – maybe that's the the tacit underlying threat that, you know, you you either host it or you um mm. you pull out of the tournament altogether and it, and it goes across the border. Um, mm. Again, th- these things are forever, forever Pakistan difficult. Pakistan went to India. Pakistan went to India for the World Cup. So, you know, they'd probably – you know, I, I, I'm not saying they would show up in this – circumstance well but i think that the, 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 the line i've seen from the pcb is that that would be the end of that they would no longer sure. um go to india for these things but this is the this is the power that's wielded this is the dynamic um mm. so i mean you'd love to see a world where i mean the best case scenario here is that india do go to pakistan for the champions trophy mm. right that there's reciprocity for what pakistan were willing to do last year and yet mm. there'll be some who say that um after what happened in 2008 that Pakistan never um, get to have India visit again. Um, I mean, I don't want to get into the, the nitty gritty of the, the, the politics of this either, but I mean, you, you can't tell me that Pakistan would have felt um, overjoyed about the prospect of going into to India last year. They wouldn't have felt like it was the necessarily the safest place in the world for them to be either, but ultimately the, mm. the professionalism kicks in. Um, well, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's one interesting thing here is, is looking at the schedules on the, the major cricket websites. Uh, there's nothing for the Champions Trophy. There's just a big <laughs> gap. When you, when you look at the future, you know, upcoming series, you've got a Pakistan tri-series with New Zealand and South Africa, which has a final in Multan on February the 14th. And then there is no international cricket listed until March 16th when Pakistan play New Zealand in Christchurch in a T20 international. So that's it. That's the, that, that's 
how the people who actually track these things for a living are seeing mm. it, which is that nothing is official. There are no official fixtures. Like we know what dates games are supposed to be played on because the PCB did put those out. But um, according to the record keepers of the game, that tournament still doesn't exist, even though it's just around the corner. Uh, Jeff, as we go off to a break, I'm looking out the window here and watching India do their slips fielding. Um, and I'll tell you what, their new training kit's really good. They've, they've no longer got the blue shirts and um, and blue shorts. They've actually got a white shirt, predominantly white shirt with black panelling, but the trousers or the shorts they're wearing have got gold down the legs. Really good. I like it. Love to get a pair. Anyway, we'll see. Our show today is brought to you in conjunction with Morris Blackburn Lawyers, who are with us throughout the course of the summer of 2024-25. Uh, You're going to hear a lot about them. Uh, Australia's number one plaintiff law firm uh, have been fighting for the rights of workers since 1919 uh, and have some of the most experienced and best lawyers working for them. Um, part of this is, and I, I mentioned this on, I think one of the apps I released earlier this week, is that the ease of the managing the process for you can't be underestimated. I mean, they listen to your story, they give you clear advice, they handle mm -hmm. the legal side for you so you don't have to and they support you through the complexity on either side. So the idea is they want you to relax. If you go to Morris Blackburn, You've got some of the best uh, lawyers in the country, in Australia, looking after you. They've got 30 offices around the country. So there are plenty of options to do that face-to-face -face, or they can come to you. There's, 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 there's availability for that as well. So wherever they see inequality and fairness and, and unfairness, they feel duty bound to speak up and act. Um, and yeah, the system works because they've, they've spoken up uh, for those who have um, had unfairness perpetrated upon them countless mm -hmm. times before. So um, uh, Morris Blackburn Lawyers, all the links are in the show notes. If you feel like you need legal assistance, please uh, head their way and make sure they can look after you as they have been for working people since 1919. When when you need to get a lawyer, you want to feel like you can relax. Some of the defendants in the uh, Alan Jones defamation case probably feeling a bit more relaxed this week. <laughs> Uh, just, just, just float that out there. Not that oh, Morris yeah. Blackburn are involved in defo, um, but, but I'm sure they'd do a solid job if they Gosh, were. maybe I should say that on the way to the break. We should have another Alan Jones conversation. We spoke about this mm. years ago. The, the, um, it was one thing for him to have significant influence on the Aussie team in the 90s when people knew less. But mm. the fact that he was still right in the thick of things in the last, mm -hmm. shall we say, the last six years, to use a, yep. a reference point, 2018, after the 2018 and, that, and post yeah well i'm i'm i'm, I'm emphasizing mm. after 2018 mm. when mm. it was pretty clear that um that, that a number of very senior people uh, in the australian setup were were still um you know, working with at jones and by jones, by working with i mean mentored and, and close friends with um mm. yeah where was the yeah how was that allowed fair, to there was a fair bit of information available at that time is 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 all yeah. that, and how was that I'm allowed to say, play out how was that yeah how mm. was that allowed to play out why was that normal why was that fine mm. um mm. where was the leadership being shown at that point to say no 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 this is not this mm. is not the way this should happen mm -hmm. anyway that's mm. um probably a conversation for another time and one we're not going to have today what we're going to do is take a break we're back in a sec um it's a busy show a lot more to come it's a final word. Uh, it's Adam Collins with you in Perth. It's Jeff Lemon with me in Melbourne. Um, and I teased this belatedly in segment one that, boy, oh boy, is there a bit going on in Pakistan this week? <laughs> um, uh, so um, did they sack Jason Gillespie? Um, did they not? Well, Piercing. Daniel Rasool has can, can, been- Can I just say this before we start? Um, yes, please. We, we recorded a program, Adam, on April the 30th this year when it was uh, formally announced- that Jason Gillespie would be appointed. And I don't remember exactly what the comment was. I think there might've been a social media clip about it uh, where we said, we said, let's take oh, yeah. sweepstakes on yes. how long, how long is it going to be before we had Kirsten and Dizzy? How long are they both going to be in the job? And I think I said six months. I, I said, I think. I, I, reckon, be, I reckon I said six months. I think you might've been even be more bullish, but, but, we, but yeah. we, we definitely had like, it was a month, not years prediction <laughs> yep. in both of our cases. Well, that was six months and 20 days ago. <laughs> so <laughs> I think pretty close to the pin. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not surprising that things have fallen apart because they, they usually tend to um, entropy. Uh, it just exists on a faster timeline. It's, it's, there's an accelerometer of entropy somehow in Pakistan cricket. 
We had Daniel on earlier this year um, after the Sydney Test match to give us a wonderful breakdown of everything that's going on in, in Pakistan cricket. It's been a volatile year. He's been breaking all the stories. So better than uh, you and me, Jeff, uh, gibbering on, speculating about his stories. I thought I'd get him on, and but the time zones didn't line up. So instead, he's very kindly sent us a detailed voice note on what the fuck is going on in Pakistan. Well, I'm not sure where to start the story, so I do feel sure this isn't the end of it. Um, I think... I think it's safe to begin this one on the final day of Pakistan's first test match against England in Multan last month. Pakistan just lost that test by an innings and for the third time in three months, they rejigged their selection committee, bringing in, among others, Aleem Dar, the former umpire, and Akib Javed, the former fast bowler, the former Pakistan fast bowler. And very quickly, it sort of became clear that the chairman had entrusted the selectors, and most notably Akib, to exercise real power over this team. Initially, the PCB still listed the coaches Gillespie and Kirsten as maintaining a berth on the selection committee, but it was very soon officially confirmed that they had lost that power. We remember that famous press conference where Gillespie listed himself as just a match day strategist, and the following day, he gave Sky Sports an interview saying that this isn't what he signed up for. Um, his, I think his displeasure was clear. Um, anyhow, on the Monday morning after Pakistan turned that test series against England around, I came to know that Kirsten had been so disgruntled with his diminished role that he was resigning and he would issue a statement explaining why. Um, a couple of hours after we published that story, the PCB officially confirmed that he had resigned, but they didn't explain why he had. They just said they'd accepted his resignation. Kirsten's statement never came and soon after I came to know that he wouldn't be making a statement after all. Uh, now, whether this is for contractual reasons or because the PCB and Kirsten reached some kind of financial arrangement, um, for each party to stay silent, that we can only speculate. I cannot confirm that in any way. But remember, just try and appreciate how extraordinary this all is. The PCB spent months recruiting these guys. The chairman, Mohsen Nakhvi, made a point of insisting they wanted world-class coaches. And upon their appointments in April, he said that their stellar track records precede them. Um, but Kirsten had now left without pa coaching Pakistan in a single ODI. The format, remember, that made his name as a coach when he won that 2011 ODI World Cup with India. Um, but anyhow, the PCB then said Gillespie would take charge of the White Ball series in Australia. They pointedly did not also appoint him interim coach for the Tour of Zimbabwe, which starts in a few days, a week after the Australia Tour ends. Um, but as for the most recent hubbub around Gillespie, what appears to have happened is as follows. Late last week, I learned that Gillespie was approached by the PCB to take on the White Ball role on an interim basis until the end of the Champions Trophy. However, he was asked to do this without a monetary change to his current contract, effectively to take on two extra formats in which Pakistan play at least 17 games until the end of the Champions Trophy, free of charge. Gillespie is understood to have found this not only unacceptable, but disrespectful and turned it down. We know Gillespie has generally felt he hasn't been treated with the professionalism and respect he deserves, and I also understand that he will not resign, which means if the PCB are to let him go, they will have to pay out the entirety of his contract which still has about a year and a half to run. After that, what happened is disputed, but we came to learn over the weekend from multiple sources that the PCB was strongly considering appointing Akib Javed, the de facto selection committee leader, as head coach until the Champions Trophy in all formats, and that they'd announced this on the Monday, so the 18th of November. And the danger with breaking any PCB-related news story at this time is that anything can change on a sixpence. Nothing is guaranteed until it's officially announced because the chairman has veto powers over effectively every call. So once we hit publish on the news that Akib was expected to take over all formats, which would effectively end Gillespie's time with the Pakistan side, the reaction online from Pakistan supporters was overwhelmingly negative. They were displeased that this should even be considered. Uh, now, whether as a result of that reaction or not, the PCB, who we have established with a high degree of confidence, were planning on making this decision, put out a tweet saying that they were refuting the news that we, that I, had published at Crick Info. However, the wording of that tweet, too, was indicative because the backing Gillespie was given was extremely qualified and equivocal. They said, and this is a direct quote, that Jason Gillespie will continue to coach the Pakistan side for the two red ball matches against South Africa. That series is over the Boxing Day New Year period, um, but Gillespie, remember, has a contract till 2026. Pakistan play a test series a little over a week after that South Africa series ends, and yet the PCB's reputation made no mention of that. And when we asked them whether he'd be coached beyond that South Africa series, they did not comment. 
The following day, he wa- as this, this is the bit that you'll remember, while Gillespie was coaching Pakistan during that third T20. Before that game had even finished, the PCB announced that this would be his last white ball game as Pakistan coach. And none other than Akib Javed was taking over as the white ball coach until the end of the Champions Trophy. Uh, the PCB called him an interim coach, but his power appears to be vastly greater than Gillespie's because it was announced he would keep his place on the selection committee, which leads to this bizarre situation where the interim white ball coach will have a say in team selection across all formats, including the format he is not a coach of. Meanwhile, the full-time test coach, Gillespie, cannot have a say in matters of selection in the very format he's coaching, so Akip can choose who plays in those Pakistan tests against South Africa that Gillespie will at least notionally be coach for. The PCB will argue, as they're well within their rights to, I should I point out, that Gillespie's ouster was never on the agenda. But in my view, where the balance of power lies at the moment is transparently clear. And what lies ahead for Gillespie beyond that South Africa series is anything but. Thanks so much to Daniel. One of the best journos in the world, I reckon, at the moment. He's been all over this story. Um, and he's definitely right in his kind of conclusion that by dint of reporting on this and the backlash online when he broke the Gillespie story, I have no doubt that changed the course of history. You know, it's a tail wags a dog thing, right? Where mm. uh, had he not broke the story, I think, his, you know, nature would have played out. The course of nature would have been that Gillespie wouldn't still be in the job, but the mm. reporting of it, and the backlash online and how ridiculous it looked that he'd be um, removed having just led them from you know a 2-1 victory, come from behind test victory, mm. um, and all the other bits and pieces about the, the fact that they were essentially asking him to work for free with the white ball team. Um, and now the added detail there from Daniel about Kirsten uh, and other bits and pieces going on there. Um, it, look, it's, it's, um, it, it's easy to go to that trope and that cliche about Pakistan cricket. We've tried to avoid that over the years, but... For whatever reason, 2024 has been, even by you know the standards that they're, they're that, that that are held in usual times, this has been wild. Uh, and mm-hmm. the last week, perhaps the wildest of them all. Well, I mean, you know, we talked about it a few weeks ago about like you talk about um, packing the Supreme Court, right? Expand the court, Let's expand the selection panel in Pakistan. Yeah. Let's get 17 blokes on there. <laughs> Just first 17 to show up to a T20 um, against New Zealand in Multan. They're all on the selection panel if you first through the gate, something like that. And, and then to be at a point where you've got that many on the selection panel and your coach isn't one of them and your captain isn't one of them. Um, all of the ridiculous power play stuff going on there. And, and Gillespie already shitty about that. And then being asked, like you say, oh, you, you've signed on to run one team. Could you run three instead? That'd yeah. be fine. That'd be great if you could do that. Thanks, buddy. Um, you know, understandable that that he would have cracked the shits about it. So so, so now we're in a bit of limbo, are we, where he's sort of officially still the test coach, but they're not yeah, going mean- to have him. They're, he's not going to be the white ball coach, but the white ball coach is a selector. And yeah. Gillespie's not a selector for the test. Yeah, match. I mean the guts of it is is that they'll go to those test matches That's against um, against South Africa, and if they and right. like they even though his contracts, <laughs> yeah, even though his contracts out for two, yeah, you know, he's got a contract for eighteen more months, yeah. but they've only specified the next series for the yeah. test matches. So if right. um, if South Africa beat them two 0 I mean they'll just sack him then. Um, yeah. That'll because it, it seems to me like now he's you know seen as a problem child. <laughs> he's been happy to speak publicly about the issues that are going on privately, and that's his prerogative, of course. Um, of course, that's his prerogative. Um, but all that effort to get Kirsten and, and mm. Gillespie in, all that, so many mm. people were, were touted. Um, and yeah, we, we did talk about this at some length at the time about it being something that you just need to take yeah. on, knowing that it may not last forever. But you just um, need, yeah. basically you need to assume it's a six month contract. Like no matter yeah. how long, it's it's like signing on as manager of Chelsea in around two thousand and eight. You know, like it doesn't matter how many years they put on the contract, you're going to get six months tops and if things don't go well in that six months you're out well it could also it could it's a book deal as well isn't it you think that dizzy finishes here at pakistan and then has a really interesting story to tell about what really happened and then mm. you know can cash in a second time i don't know hope so True. he has been in charge of the white ball team in australia they did come from behind and win the one day as 2-1 which we discussed last week but australia bounced back in the shortest form winning 3-0 mm. the first game was a seven over slash smash where max you made 43 from 19, and, and that was enough to get them to 93 for four in their seven overs. And Pakistan lost nine wickets trying to haul it down, yeah. and they got nowhere near it, which gave um, Bartlett, who was back in the side after missing a lot of cricket through injury, made such an impressive start to his international career earlier this year. Um, Nathan Ellis as well, 
um, to cash in and, and Adam Zampa likewise. Not bad timing for those white ball bowlers taking wickets for mm-hmm. the IPL draft this week as well, Jeff. Oh, true, true. That can come through. Well, yeah, so, we, you know, Bartlett, the the president, um, and Spencer Johnson, who was supposed to play a big part in England and ended up getting injured and none of that came through. But, um, yeah, Spencer Johnson in the second game, 5 for 26. Yep. Destroyed Pakistan, five of the top seven. I mean, that's bloody good timing to, to do it that way. So, yeah, the first game... First game was seven, seven overs aside, so no no Waikiki formula applied. No <laughs> Duckworth Lewis, just just seven overs straight. I mean, kind of absurd to decide a game in that way, but yeah, nice nice for Glenn Maxwell after a, a run of outs in the ODIs to to make that quick forty and be player of the match. It's funny how quickly T Twenties can turn things around. That second game was more conventional. Australia one forty seven for nine. Actually struggled again against Harris Ralph, who's mm. just had a hell of a tour and tore them up again. He got Fraser McGurk and Inglis consecutive balls early, came back to get Tim David out and then Bartlett as he got into the the lower order. Um, but Australia just sort of shuffled around, got enough contributions in the the teens, 20s, 30s, um, with Matt Short made 32 at the top and, and top scored. Aaron Hardy, increasingly important to 28 quick runs at the end and, and that let Spencer Johnson rip him up with that five. And bowl out Pakistan for 134 and then that third mm. game in Hobart was a very complete bowling performance. Johnson, Hardy, Alice, Zampa, Bartlett all taking wickets. Bowl them out for 117. Stoinis freed up and waxed 61 off 27 balls down at uh, the Boot Stadium at Bell Reeve and hit five sixes along the way and um, the, the real downside from that, Glenn Maxwell pinging a hamstring. Don't know if we have any read on whether that was cramp or how bad it is or whether it's a long-term thing um, this coming after. So we'd, we'd shifted around the Melbourne uh, live show on the 29th on the basis that he might have been playing a game that day um, but probably won't be playing anything much for a while. No, that, that's all been out there yesterday. So it's a it's a grade two um, hamstring, which means that yeah, he's out for the, for the next little while, um, which is yeah, obviously just very difficult to, you know, <laughs> From a journalistic perspective, that's the news. From a personal perspective, yeah, of course, it's gutting because he, he had this cricket coming up, which was really exciting between the Pakistan series and the um, and the and the Big Bash, and that red ball cricket now won't be possible, which is really sad for him. Um, it, it probably means that if he is going to make it to Sri Lanka in the Test squad, one of two things need to happen: they need to pick him on gut and on no red ball cricket, or they need to pick him um, on the basis of him tearing it up in the BBL. But yeah, it'll be. A few weeks, I suppose, at least. Usually, grade twos are twenty-one days, aren't they? So, mm-hmm. um, we'll see how he goes there. But yeah, he picked that up when, when, um, uh, you know, in the field and um, didn't bat in the end. He made that forty-three from nineteen balls and like up and about again, having struggled in the one day. As you like, right? You know, a bit of positive energy around him, and yeah, unfortunately, it just didn't didn't quite come to pass. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we did in in the middle of all that rearrange the live shows. Maybe we should quickly discuss that in case. That hasn't been um, communicated widely enough. I'm ever mm-hmm. mindful that not everyone listens to every show. Um, so Maxi, yeah, due to his playing schedule, we, we moved the 29th to the 22nd of December, which is great, by the way. We're at the Hi-Fi Bar, um, which is a venue that, as we said on that brief mm-hmm. episode the other day, we've been to loads for music, very similar to the corner in its feel um, for, for gigs and that kind of thing. So that'll be a, a top place for us to be right in the heart of the city across the road from the town hall there. So. Yep. That's a bit it's of a Christmas show to the capital, so it's next door to where the show was going to be previously, because we we couldn't get the yeah. capital again for the change date. Um, but it is thirty eight meters away. I had a look on Google Maps today. <laughs> yeah, so there'll be no material difference other than the date. Um, the, the size of the venue is a little bit smaller as well, but still, that, that's all good. It'll be a great um, night. So yeah, twenty second will be yeah Christmas party energy. Glenn's book launch will be there to sign all the books and. Of course, there'll, there'll be um, other guests as well, which we'll announce nearer the time. Um, we're still mm. over a month away from that show. But yeah, jump on um, and do as you do. We've got all the other live shows that we've got between times. So we've got Adelaide the night before the test. Thank you to everyone on Discord who was thrilled that I managed to finally get the fucking date right for that. I've got it wrong about seven times. But night before the Adelaide test match um, is, is Aaron Finch, uh, who will be on stage with Brat as well. <laughs> Uh, Izzy Westbury will be with us in Perth ahead of Harsha Bogle Brisbane. joining for the Brisbane even. Christ, where I'm in Perth. Harsha will be You're in, in Perth. Brisbane. You're in Perth um, With Izzy. Is Izzy's here too. Tomorrow. Izzy did arrive in in, um, in Perth um, overnight um, as well. Okay. Not on the same flight, but I know she's here. Um, uh, but, yeah, so uh, there'll be um, opportunities to see us do our thing. Yeah, a couple of nights from now in Perth or tomorrow in Perth, then um, in Adelaide night before the test, Brisbane two nights before the test, 
Melbourne three nights before Christmas and Sydney, uh, which is the second part of the Maxi book launch. So we'll do the same kind of uh, Maxwell type show there on night five of the Border Gavaska test if it goes five days. If it doesn't go five days, it'll be the day after the series. So either way, crossroad from the ground it should work perfectly. Get your tickets in all the usual places. One last bit on the White Ball series. Matt Short, Jake Fraser McGurk, opening pair across both series, 50 over and 20 over. I, I wanted Fraser McGurk to be opening everything in England. I thought that's that's what should happen to, to get a look at him. Away from home in a, in a against a high-profile opponent, um, but they've gone with that. So Matt Short did well in England. They put Fraser McGurk in this time around. Neither of them have set the world alight. Um, Jake... The scores 16, 13, 7, 9, 20, 18, Matt Short, 1, 19, 22, 7, 32, 2. But their partnerships are interesting. They've, they've managed at least a little bit of a partnership in every innings, 20, 21, 19, 16, 52, and 16. So I, I, like, I want this to work. I think this is quite a, a, a an, an exciting prospect. But I guess anytime Travis Head's available, he'll be opening the batting and white ball cricket. Yeah. So they're, they're unlikely to stay together. But... The, the possibilities are there and they've almost almost done enough just on those opening partnerships, right? Like assuming you want a score of about 200 in, in T20 cricket, if your openers are putting on 20 or they're putting on 20% of it, if they do it quickly, they've done something. You know, obviously you want a lot more um, some of the time, but that's not always going to happen. But yeah, just curious to get your read on that. Well, I don't think either of them are playing in the Champions Trophy. Um, mm. I think it'll be Inglis opening with head over there. Um, and they'll have Kerry back in the side um, for that. I'd, I'd be, yeah, they'll, they'll absorb because Kerry's in career best form um, and, and has been. And, you know, it's funny what a bit of time off can do, right? Kerry, I think he's averaging 24 across the previous 14 months in Test cricket until the 98 not out. And that was between the century at Melbourne and the 98 not out in, in Christchurch. Then he took six months off. He, he was at Major League cricket, but didn't get a game. He was just in the squad. Um, mm. And since then, he's been um, untouchable in shield cricket, in 50-over cricket. Of course, the way you played in England, a couple of really important 70s in the one-day team, getting yourself, getting yourself back in the team. So, um, yeah, I think that Kerry back in that white ball set up and doing well means they need to find a new spot for Inglis. And, of course, Inglis is, um, has to play, and he's open for Australia as well. So mm. I, I don't think either of them will make the 50-over tournament. However, there's always a 20-over World Cup around the corner, isn't there? That's the way it works with every second year. So that might be more one for, you know, 2026. Can these two, you know, we mm. said earlier about it's very rare you see your air quotes best 11 playing yep. in, in, until the very um, build up to a major event. It might just be they give these two a chance to bet in in 20 over cricket for the next couple of years and see mm. whether they can make it stick between now and um, 26 is in South Africa and Namibia and Zimbabwe, I'm pretty sure. It's in, uh, um, no, it's, the T20 World Cup is India. Um, India, oh, India, right. What, what am I thinking of? There's, there's a South Africa, there's a, there's a 50 and Namibia. over World Cup in 27. Oh, 50 over World Cup, right. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So confusing my tournaments. But still, nevertheless, um, I think that's probably where it all where it all plays out. But uh, I'm, we will see. I'm, I'm going to throw in one, one thing about Inglis. Um, <clears throat> the little uh, cricket.com put up a, a, a video because he was captaining that, yep. um, that T20 series, getting him to name all of the previous T20, oh, Australia's amazing. T20 captains. Um, pretty like pretty good, and obviously like sporkle brained. You know, I'm doing it alongside as he's doing it, trying to see <laughs> see if I can um, do the same thing. And and may I don't know if it's, it's just a Victorian thing or something, but almost the first one I thought of was Cameron White, and that's the last one that he gets. Um, and and he's jumping around a bit in terms of chronology as well. Like he does a few of the recent ones, then early, then comes back again, mixes up between them. Um, was it, I think it was Louis Cameron behind the camera doing it. I'm just suspicious. I'm going to ask, I'm going to grill Louis about this. I'm like, did you, was the last one a throwdown? Did someone signal to him off off camera about Cameron White? Because he gets it right on the buzzer and there's a long pause there. And I'm like, I don't know if he's, he's just been thinking about much more recent players. Like at what point does his brain tick back to Cameron White? Was it, was it a fix? Was it the fine cotton affair? Did you <laughs> fix that video, Louis? I want to know. I'm coming to Perth and I'm finding out. It was bloody impressive. I, I'm not good mm. at the sporkle. For whatever reason, I, my brain doesn't work well. I mean, I remember a lot of stuff. I retain a lot of information, but I can't do it in that setting. So I was nowhere. Um, I wouldn't have done well at all. But yeah, 15 out of 15, mm. was that took some doing mad respect for him there. 